Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on foreclosures. I'm uh, Mindy Knutson. I am the exiting executive director for the Utah chapter and happy to be here. We will give everyone just a few minutes to get logged on, settled in, and start right at the top of the hour. So in the meantime, enjoy our promos and announcements from some of our sponsors. Hi everyone. So my name is Reed Dressler. I am so excited to be the new chapter CED. Uh, I am so excited to get to work, to get to know everyone. I want to make sure that we have an amazing organization that can help educate people and keep them up to date with information surrounding homeowner and condominium and all sorts of community associations. I want to thank everyone that's attending today. And again, I'm just so excited to get to know every one of you. I want to thank our sponsor first before we move on. It's Gore's Construction. They have over 20 years of experience working with homeowner management companies. They've created their service division in response to existing client needs. Their dedicated homeowner association service team can assist you and your HOA needs with various building repairs. They can handle repair projects ranging from water leak investigations to large scale exterior building repairs. Gore's Construction is committed to ensuring that even the smallest of jobs is executed with quality and integrity from start to finish. So we encourage you to watch for our event sponsor and our platinum chapter sponsors handouts in your email after the webinar. During the presentation, if you have a question for the panelists, please type it on the questions feature. Our moderator, Liz Richards, will be there watching those and posing them to the speaker during and after each of their presentations. At the end of the webinar, we will ask for final questions. If you have one, type yes then we will know to wait for you to type the question. So everyone, please pay attention and be kind to our moderator, Liz Richards. I'm gonna jump in really quickly, everyone. Good morning, welcome to our foreclosures webinar. Our annual meeting is going to be held directly after this, this morning's webinar. So we hope that you will stay tuned for a little, little while so we can get some official business done today. Uh, we also want you to look forward to our November 19th webinar on rental policies. And today we'd like to welcome our new board members, Todd Bean and Megan Deming. We are very excited to have them join our UCCAI uh, board and it's gonna be a great year. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, we are also very, very excited and very happy to have Reed uh, joining as our new executive director uh, we, he's got a lot of skills and a lot of experience that is really going to help take our chapter to the next level. With that, Liz, I'll let you take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Lauren. All right. I'm going to introduce our speakers today uh, for the foreclosure webina webinar. Uh, we have Brian Morgan, an attorney with Maxwell & Morgan. Mr. Morgan is a shareholder with Maxwell & Morgan PC, where he practices exclusively in community association law litigation. Mr. Morgan has helped chair the Legislative Action Committee for the Community Associations Institute, CAI, Central Arizona chapter, where he participates in reviewing and analyzing state legislation involving community associations. Mr. Morgan is, only, is one of only a handful of attorneys in Arizona that has been admitted to the National College of Community Association Lawyers. 
Mr. Morgan has been invited to participate as a faculty member for educational seminars on a local and national level, including seminars presented by CAI, Arizona Association of Community Managers, the National Business Institute, the Leadership Center, Lorman, Arizona School of Real Estate, and Half Moon Seminars. Mr. Morgan has served on the Education Committee for AACM, where he assisted in drafting course material for the training of community managers throughout Arizona. We also have James Purcell, who's an attorney with Bangor Fraser Group. Mr. Purcell is an attorney with the law firm Bangor Fraser Group, located in St. George, Utah. His practice has focused primarily on community association law over the last nine years, during which time he has helped dozens of community associations collect tens of thousands of dollars in past due assessments and fees. Mr. Purcell currently serves on the board for Utah Community Association Law Section. So welcome you guys, and I will turn the time over to James to start his presentation. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Liz, can you hear me? I assume you can. Brian's nodding, so that's a good sign. Well, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be presenting with um, Brian. Um, he's a very knowledgeable attorney, and so um, any of the tough questions I can easily pass off to him because he has a wealth of knowledge that they'll benefit from. Um, kind of we've divided the presentation in half today. Um, Brian and I have. I'm kind of taking the beginning part. Um, I'm going to be going over kind of some of the more fundamental parts of um, foreclosures and lawsuits and how to collect on um, past due assessments, namely non-judicial foreclosures. Um, and there's been some changes to the law there as well that we'll go into. Uh, Brian has some very interesting and maybe more nuanced and detailed material covered on the second half, the second end of this. So I hope that there's something for everyone here that they will gain or at least be refreshed on. Um, hopefully it's a good learning experience for everyone. They'll be able to get something. Um, Starting out, you can see the, the title of my presentation. Um, obviously, we focus on non-judicial foreclosures and lawsuits. There's many ways to collect past due assessments. Today, we're focusing on those two primary methods. Uh, in my opinion, the two most effective methods. So starting out, assessments are the lifeblood of an association, some say. But what can you do when a homeowner won't pay? Sometimes gentle reminders and demand letters only go so far, and other action must be taken to bring an account up to par. Yes, you could hire a hitman or publicly shame them till it stings, but usually the law tends to frown on such things. So what can you do when your HOA has assessment deficit exposure? You can bring down the hammer of a lawsuit for non-judicial foreclosure. And so that's kind of the the segue into where we're going with this today. Um, if I can get the slide thing here to work. There we go. So, kind of the, the overview, the 30,000 foot view here at the beginning. And a lot of people listening to this probably already know this, but I think it's a very good refresher. Um, like I said, the two areas we're focusing on today are um, non judicial foreclosure and a lawsuit. From the 30,000 foot level, um, non judicial foreclosure, in my experience, is a very effective, in my opinion, in experience, the most effective. And getting people to pay um, past due assessments. That's the first bullet point there. Extremely effective and powerful. However, with some changes to the, to the law, at least here in Utah, um, and just some mechanics with the way the non judicial foreclosure process works, there are some drawbacks. We'll go into detail on those, but um, just kind of highlighting some of those that we'll talk about later. Um, assessments have to be a certain age now if you're going to go all the way through and do a non judicial foreclosure on, on past due assessments. Um, Usually the process from beginning to end is 150 days minimum. And I say minimum because I don't, I mean, it's going to be usually a little bit longer than that, but there's a, you know, you're looking at about six months from beginning to end, best case scenario. Also with non-judicial foreclosures, um, you can't include fines um, anymore. And you'll see that, that change here, and we'll talk about that here a little bit later. Switching gears to lawsuits. Like I said, we'll go into more detail on all of these. Um, lawsuits. Can be as short as a few weeks and they can be as long as a few or even several months um, depending on how they respond um, whether you bring the claim in small claims or district court uh, be able to get service their response etc we'll talk about some of those things so it can be longer than 150 or even shorter than 150 days as opposed to the non-judicial foreclosure timeline 
Um, one of the big positives of the lawsuits is they do not have to be a certain age assessments. Um, go after them, um, even if they're not um, certain time, certain length of delinquency. Um, another big positive of lawsuits, we'll talk about this later, is you can include fines. Um, in fact, that's the only way to go after fines, basically. Um, and so we'll talk about that. And then one of the drawbacks I've encountered, at least, in lawsuits is um, you get to the finish line, you get the judgment, and you have to collect, right? That's oftentimes the real battle begins uh, when it comes to lawsuits. We'll talk about some of that um, here in a minute. But like I said, from the 30,000 foot view, I think it's a good slide to kind of um, help everyone kind of understand the, some of the subtle differences between those two. So before we go, in, at least I'm going to focus first on non-judicial foreclosure, second on lawsuits. Um, but I think we can all agree, you know, assessments of the lifeblood of an association, right? And that's the income, that's how things are run, they're vital. Um, and likewise, or in turn, it's vital that um, property managers or uh, attorneys who are helping associations collect, or even board members, are um, staying up to date on who's paying assessments, who's not paying assessments, and making sure the flow of income is continuing to, to occur. And not only is that vital for the association's well-being, but it's also important, obviously, even just from a sense of fairness. Um, that all members are, you know, contributing to uh, the benefits and also uh, responsibilities the association has and uh, helps its members with. So just kind of some basic pointers, and I know a lot of property managers already know these things, but I think it's helpful. Um, there's certain things that property managers can do to help um, either the themselves or the attorney that they tend to turn the account over to um, an attorney in the collection process. The first one is become familiar with the governing documents. And it seems kind of like a simple one, and obviously for property managers, sometimes that's difficult, right? You manage dozens or um, even more associations. How do you possibly become really familiar with all their governing documents? Um, but I think a certain level of even basic familiar, familiarity is important for the property managers and certainly for boards. And when it gets sent over to a law firm, especially so for the law firm. Um, and it's mostly just, as it obviously relates to collections, the provisions on collections. Um, I often tell property managers it's great to, um, you know, if they have the governing documents uploaded in their server, highlight the provisions that talk about the collection process, or, you know, have a spreadsheet and identify the articles that talk about uh, the collection uh, process. Um, it's not only the process, but, you know, the types of things that the association can um, add on to or um, go after when assessments aren't paid. For example, interest rates, late fees, um, those are all important. And although the statutes, at least in Utah, fill in many of those gaps, if the governing documents are silent, um, oftentimes the governing documents aren't silent. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've encountered a ledger where the property manager sends it over to me and they say, okay, James, here's the late fees, um, 18%, and I say, or 12%. And one of the first things I do is open up the governing documents, usually Article 4 of the, of the CCNR talks about assessments, could change. And I go in there just to find out that um, interest is capped at 5% for the, the CCNR. It says that right there. Or um, late fees, like, hey, you know, we hit them with a $50 late fee every single month, like clockwork. I look at the ledger and I tally them up and there's $500 in late fees. But I go in there and read the governing documents to find out that it can't be $50 a month, it's just a one time late fee of $50 uh, delinquent assessment not paid. And so there's these nuances, it's just great to become familiar with them and make sure that whatever um, county mechanism the board or property manager is using corresponds with the governing documents. I know it's a simple thing, but um, please keep that in mind. Next point there is obviously keep an accurate and up-to-date ledger. I think most um, property management companies and even boards do a pretty good job at that, um, but that's, Extremely important in any obviously collection effort. I'm sure um, Brian might even allude to some of that when it comes to fair debt collection practices and things later on as far as making sure you get the numbers right. Um, but that's just a very important thing. And then lastly, and there's, I could have done dozens of these. These are some of the ones that really jumped off the page that I've seen in recent years. Um, make sure the HOA or the association is part of the HOA or association registry. Um, in Utah, you have to be on this registry in order to, to file um, a lien against the property. Many times I've encountered situations where a homeowners association will send the account over to me and say, hey, James, will you start the collection process? Um, and we start by wanting to put a lien. But the first thing I do every single time when I get a collections account is I check to make sure that the homeowners association is on this Utah's lien registry. And if they're not, I tell them, hey, 
need to get registered on there so we can um, put the lien on the property. So just things to check and make sure um, we're doing, and it just makes the transition for collections a lot, lot easier. So <clears throat> the rest of the presentation today, I'd like to kind of, like I said, focus on those two main areas, non-judicial foreclosure and lawsuits, and just go over kind of some of the distinctions, the differences, the pros, the cons, and especially as it relates to non-judicial foreclosure, some of the updates in Utah law that have happened in the last you know, year and a half or so um, that have kind of changed the process and um, things that we should consider or at least be aware of um, as we prepare for collecting through this um, non-judicial foreclosure uh, or deciding whether should we take a different route of a lawsuit. So the process, and I guess I could have put this for even a, a lawsuit as well. It carries both ways and it kind of dovetails in the previous slide. But anytime um, the association is going to begin the non-judicial foreclosure process, for the lawsuit for that matter, obviously the very first step is gathering all the information, right? So they send the account over to the attorney's office oftentimes, um, and we're trying to decide whether to take the lawsuit route or the non-judicial foreclosure route. And oftentimes a lot of that is based upon the information that the association um, where the property manager is able to give us. So like I said, um, they send over often the governing documents. Um, one of the first things I asked them was when they send over governing documents to me is I say, are these the most up-to-date documents? And hopefully they say, yeah, these are them. Um, but oftentimes, as you know, there's usually an amendment or a second amendment or third amendment or fourth amended and restatement. And it's good to have the most recent version of the governing documents, obviously, because um, there's conflicting provisions. The most recent provision or the most recent document um, it's going to oftentimes control. Um, also on that bullet point, as all most of us know, that CCNRs are usually the go-to place for um, how assessments can and should be collected in an association. Sometimes it's in the bylaws in other ways, but most of the time, nine times out of ten, I've found it's in the CCNRs. Um, you're going to want to look to the amount of the assessments and the types. And these are just simple things that we know. I've got an account recently where they said, hey, James, can you go after this? Here's all these um, annual assessments that are due. And also we have a special assessment. Can you go after that as well. And one of the first things I did, of course, was say, well, I got to look to make sure that the special assessment was properly imposed. And I looked at the governing documents and the special assessment required, for instance, a 50% 50 um, vote of the membership. I called back up the association and just said, hey, um, do we have some record of the 50% vote? And they said, well, the board approved it. Well, that's great, but it needed a 50% vote. Um, I'm not going to put a lien on someone's house unless we can, you know, verify that that was done. So obviously, when we're looking at the types of assessments through in the ledger, um, I'm going to be looking for the interest amount in the ledger. Um, Utah Code does have a section that fills in the gap if interest is unspecified in the governing documents. I think it's 10%. Um, but if it is stated in the governing documents, uh, an interest rate, we need to make sure we follow that. We're applying it per annum or whatever. Um, time period the, the governing documents are saying. Likewise, I look for provisions on attorney's fees. Um, once again, the Utah Code kind of fills in that gap on attorney's fees when it comes to um, being able to include them as part of the non-judicial foreclosure process, but I'm looking for um, if anything in the governing document says otherwise, creates some ambiguity on that issue. And like I said, late fees as well, as we talked about earlier. So we're gathering information, but a property management company can really help, um, and even an association can really help um, the collection process if they have all that mapped out and laid out in a clear and verified form when they give it to um, an attorney, or if they even try to start the process themselves by putting a lien on there. Um, and it protects them, it protects the process, it protects um, obviously members of the association and the ability to, to effectively collect assessments. So like I said, we gather information. Oh, I gotta go back now. Uh, double click it. Um, so once we've gathered the information and we decided, okay, of the two methods, let's say we're gonna do a, a non-judicial foreclosure. That process is um, almost always started with a notice of lien that's filed. And even if we don't end up doing a non-judicial foreclosure, um, I almost always advise a homeowners association to record a notice of lien anyway. I mean, just it's a kind of a uh, a way to tell the world, hey, and especially the debtor, um, you passed due on your assessments. Let's get this taken care of. So almost always starts by filing a notice of lien against the property. 
and recording it. You record it in the county recorder's office um, in the county where the property is located. And once you record that, that notice of lien, and oftentimes in the notice of lien, you'll say the lien amount um, and some other information that's required. Um, if you want to proceed with the non-judicial foreclosure of that lien, certain steps have to be made at that point. And I usually, at the same time as filing the notice of lien, um, I begin those begin that process, that required process, in order to be able to non-judicially foreclose on the lien. And that process begins by sending a notice to the debtor. And there's a code for, uh, provision in the uh, Community Association Act and the Condo Act of Utah that talks about certain things that have to be included within that notice um, to the to the person who's passed through in their assessments. And so we're gonna go over some of those today. Um, one of the things that has to be included in that notice, or one of the things that has to be done with that notice, I should say, and it's an update that happened recently in 2020 um, in the Utah Code, is that notice, like I said, I usually send it with a copy of the lien. It has to be delivered to the debtor, the person who hasn't paid on their assessments. Um, before, those who recall, um, it used to be able to be mailed. Put it in the mail, as I call it, you'll set it and forget it kind of thing. I usually do like an affidavit of mailing, so I have that in my back pocket so I can show that it was mailed, um, but that was it. Whereas now, you actually have to deliver the notice. And those who are um, familiar with um, the lawsuit process, it's very familiar, it's very similar, uh, has kind of the same taste or feel as a lawsuit, right? You have to serve the person or give them an actual notice, the process has begun. That's kind of a, a big change here to the non-judicial foreclosure process. You actually have to not only send this notice, um, but it has to be delivered to the debtor. Um, you know, you can do that, I guess, through numerous ways. I think the easiest way is like through certified mail, um, you know, return receipt, you can sign for it, you have proof um, that it was delivered. I guess you can do personal service, things like that. But you want some sort of evidence, I'll call it, that the document has been delivered. Like I said, I usually put the notice of the lien in the letter, and I'll usually include this um, notice. It's titled you know, Notice of Non-Judicial Foreclosure. I'm going to talk about some other things that are in this notice. Um, and I, then, like I said, send that, certified mail usually, to the debtor in order to verify that they've actually received it and it's been delivered. Hey, James, um, question for you. you have to do that before you take the next step. We'll talk about that here in a minute. So in delivering that notice, <clears throat> you can't take the next step in the non-judicial foreclosure process unless these um, I call them four points have been satisfied, or as long as we're not in violation of, of one of these four points. Um, if we are, then we either need to correct it or divert and go down the route of a, of a lawsuit. So number one, you can't move to the next step in the non-judicial foreclosure process if the notice was not delivered um, you need to have that done number two you can't move to the next step in the non-judicial foreclosure process if the debtor um, requests a judicial foreclosure the notice will actually say in there the person has the right to request a judicial foreclosure i'm um, usually can do it anytime within 30 days after delivery of the notice um, and if they ask for a judicial foreclosure um, you can't proceed with the non-judicial foreclosure process that's the second um, box that you have to have checked so to speak, in order to move forward with non-judicial foreclosure. Um, number three is you, the fine can't be included as part of the lien. And that's actually a new requirement in this updated section of the Utah Code. Um, in the past, I had, um, I think I'd even done it a few times where I'd begun the process of foreclosing on a fine. And the granted in Utah, you know, there's a certain period of time um, that a fine can be contested. Like you have to give them a 180 days um, to uh, basically contest the fine and the 30 day appeal period after that, it's like 210 days. Um, but then at that point it is for all intents and purposes, fair game. But now um, a fine can't be included, um, to, if you can't foreclose if the fine is part of the lien. Uh, I've talked to other attorneys here in Utah about how they kind of get around that issue. I said. I think on the one hand, it's sometimes important that a lien is included, excuse me, a fine is included in a lien, but we can't foreclose on the lien. So what do you do? 
And I, I was talking to another attorney earlier in the week and kind of a, off a creative way, but I think a good approach to it is what he does is um, he actually ends up recording two liens. You record one lien if there's past due assessments and another lien for fines. And that way the, the lien is kind of there for fines, just kind of on the property. But as far as the assessments, um, once all the requirements are done, he'll actually foreclose on the assessment lien and just let the fine lien sit there, either a judicial foreclosure or a lawsuit on it. Um, but anyway, you, you can't move to the next step, i.e. foreclosing on the property if a fine is included as part of the lien. You have to have that box checked as well, not be included and be able to move on for a foreclosure. And the last one is, this is an interesting one as well, is you can't move to the next step if some of the assessment is not at least 180 days old or delinquent. Um, this is kind of a big game changer. Um, oftentimes I get um, accounts from associations that say, hey James, you know, this person's um, you know, three months due or two months past due, let's just go as fast as we can and, and get this thing done, record the lien, and then as soon as those um, 30 days are up, do a, a notice of a default. But now under this new statute, um, we can't do that unless at least a part of that assessment is at least 180 days. It might not affect a lot of associations. I know some associations you know, have kind of a, or even property managers have some sort of internal policy. Hey, we don't even send it to an attorney unless it's already, you know, 90, 120 days old type thing. Um, but that's something to be aware of. You know, if, if we're gonna do a non-judicial foreclosure, um, the assessments have to have a certain amount of age to them. Uh, in order to the next slide to advance. Hey James, while you're waiting for that slide to advance, a question for you. Um, yeah. You had said earlier that um, you you find non-judicial foreclosure to be the most effective way of collecting. Just out of curiosity. Uh, Percentage-wise, about what percent of your associations move straight to non-judicial foreclosure as opposed to beginning with a, a lawsuit? That's a good question, Brian. It might be a function also of kind of the way I I guide them in the process, and maybe because I tend to favor non-judicial foreclosure, the number or percentage is more skewed because I tend to steer them that way. Um, I would say rough guess, 80 to 90% um, is that way. Um, in my experience, Brian, you might've seen some different things in, in Southern Utah, at least. Um, when I file the lien, and I, I don't have any you know, hard data, this is just my, my gut recollection or, or take on things. Filing the lien usually resolves 50%. Just the lien itself filing. When I send it to them, certify mail or, or otherwise, 50% of the time that gets the, the matter resolved. And then if it ever gets to the notice of default stage, um, I would say 90% of the cases at that point are resolved. We'll send that notice of default saying, oh, your property's set to be sold in, in 90 days type thing. And it's very rare, very, very rare in my experience that it ever gets to the third step of actually going to the, the courthouse steps just because um, you know, no one's going to let their home be sold for a two, three, five, even $10,000 pass to assessment. There's just too much at stake. And that's probably the reason why I, I like the non-judicial foreclosure process so much um, because it's so, for lack of a better word, heavy-handed, right? I mean, the, the hammer is so powerful. You can even pay. Um, lawsuits, I'll talk about here in one second. The, the problem I've had with lawsuits is not necessarily the service, not getting a judgment, um, but for me, it's often been collecting on the judgment afterward, right? And it just becomes this, I don't want to say nightmare, but it becomes this logistical you know, then going, okay, well, how are we going to do it? Call them in for and try to garnish their wages or try to do some rate of execution. And they're, if they're, I found usually if they're behind on their assessments, they're behind on other things as well, right? So it's like get in line as far as people I owe money to. And in order to prioritize um, in someone's mind the um, need to pay in a, a debt, um, I think the, the biggest wake up call you can do is, you know, threatening the, the home itself. So anyway, that's kind of my take on it, Brian. Good question. Perfect. Um, so if you check all those boxes before, you can then move to the next step. And I'll go quickly here through the rest of my presentation, but um, notice of default. I know all of us are probably familiar with this. I didn't put all of the requirements in here in notice of default, but you know, you file with the county recorder's office, you wait three months, send mailing 
to um, interested parties or people who filed notice of interest. Um, and you send the copy, obviously, to the to the debtor, and, and it basically says we're thinking about uh, or moving forward the process, I should say, of um, foreclosing on the home non-judicially. You have to wait three months um, from the day of filing the notice of default. After that, you can move forward with the notice of trustee sale. I usually record them. Uh, I don't know if it's a requirement, but I usually record the notice of trustee sale. You have to publish it um, once a week for three consecutive weeks in a newspaper. And there's some other requirements like putting it in the county uh, porter's office, and mailing it out, posting it on the property and things like that. But at the end of the day, another 30 days-ish, usually you know, 25 to 45 days after, um, you can sell the property. Um, in the nine years I've been doing this, I can probably count on, you know, not very many times, let's put it that way, but I've gone the distance on this process. It has happened. Uh, if you go to the courthouse steps, um, the association has a credit bid for the amount that they're owed. And it's just like an auction. I'm like an auctioneer. I get up there, blah, 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 blah. I'll do it like that. But, um, and you sell the property. And if the association gets it back for the credit bid, the association becomes the owner of the property subject to any senior interests, right? Um, sometimes people ask me, James, what do you do then if the association owns the property? Um, they can, for example, try to rent it out. Um, I had one situation a few years ago, if you can believe it or not, where an association rented the property for I think it was like two and a half years before the first mortgage ever got around to uh, foreclosing. And that might've been because of some of the financial things that were happening um, a few years ago, but it could be a source of income for the association to pay back the assessments. Um, if it's sold to a third party, which sometimes happens, um, obviously the money from the bid um, goes to the association, they're satisfied, and the third party takes the property subject to um, any senior interest. So the foreclosure process can be very, very um, effective. And as long as we're aware of those new requirements um, moving forward, and we make sure that we check all the boxes in that process. With the last little bit of time, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Brian, very, very quickly, slide to advance. Um, going to do uh, the rest of my time quickly on the lawsuit process. Some of us are, are familiar with that, others maybe not so. So I'll kind of peel back the curtain on that as much as I can. Um, lawsuit, you can bring a lawsuit in small claims. In Utah, the, the value I think is, um, now oh, there we go, now we're way out. Pulling that, but there we go. You can go back one slide, whoever's controlling, that'd be great. But the lawsuit process, you can usually do um, small claims or district. The cap on small claims is about 11,000 in Utah. Um, if it's more than that, the assessment value, you have to sue in district court. Um, or if you're seeking um, remedies outside a monetary amount, district court. So, for example, if you're doing a, a non excuse me, a judicial foreclosure, you're going to want to follow the district court. Any lawsuit, started by filing a complaint and you have to serve that complaint to the other party in this case the person owes money um, if they're in utah you have 21 days to respond to that complaint if the party files an answer you move forward toward trial in small claims it's very expedited process uh, in district court it's a little bit more lengthy um, but usually given the value it's still somewhat um, expedited if they don't file an answer which i find happens actually more often than, than you think, and when you bring a lawsuit um, for these type of situations, um, you can move forward with a default. And if you get a default, it's basically the judge saying, okay, the other party didn't respond, counsel or plaintiff, what do you want? And, and as long as it's pled in the complaint, you can get it. If someone can hit the next slide for me. Mine's giving little troubles. Um, Lawsuits, some of the great benefits of a lawsuit we talked about earlier, you can include fines. I mean, lawsuits the way to collect fines. That's just the, the way it is now in, in Utah. Um, so if you're really gonna um, hold their feet to the fire on collecting fines, lawsuits the way to do it. Can't do it through the um, non-judicial foreclosure. Um, you can include all the assessments in a lawsuit, as we talked about before. You don't have to be a certain age, like 180 days in the um, non-judicial foreclosure. And you can seek to recover damages, um, as I talked about before, or judicially foreclose. That could actually be one of the remedies you're seeking uh, in the lawsuit itself. 
And if you can forward the last slide for me. James, I have a quick question that came through the chat. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, the question is, what kind of title report do you typically order on the property in the non-judicial foreclosure process? What kind of title reports? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I've used it one guy for so many years. I've probably even gotten lax with my terminology myself because I call him up and he just knows what I, I want. I say, give me a for give me the foreclosure report is what I say. And he pulls it up and he pulls up um, anybody who has uh, a recorded interest in the property, right? And that includes any senior liens. If there's a first mortgage, a second mortgage, uh, on each of those who the trust or who the trustee is, who the beneficiaries are. Um, he's easy, even good about pulling up, obviously, any notice of interest that have been filed. Um, Utah law contemplates that if someone wants notice that the non-judicial foreclosure process is moving forward, they can record what's called a, uh, not a notice, a, a, yeah, well, basically a notice of interest, but it's a, um, a notice that if they have a question, excuse me, a notice that if um, someone's beginning the process, you have to then provide that person notice that you are moving forward with foreclosure. So I usually call him and just say, hey, give me your foreclosure report. He puts that all together for me. I don't know if, Brian, you've used it enough to where you have certain terminology. You go to different guys and say, hey, give me these certain reports um, by name. But I usually call him up and say, hey, give me the, the title or the foreclosure report. And he just pulls up knowing exactly what I'm looking for. We typically call them a trustee's sale guarantee. Okay, same, there you go. Same concept. Same concept. Great question. Um, and then just the very last thing here, and I'll, I'll wrap up here. I kind of alluded to this before. Um, lawsuits can be very effective. Um, my personal um, issue I've sometime encountered with lawsuits is once you get the judgment, as I alluded to before. You get the judgment, you have the piece of paper there, hey, this person owes me $3,500, um, but all you have at that point is the piece of paper, right? You have to go after them at that point. Um, there's many mechanisms in Utah to do that. Um, one of the most effective I found is supplemental proceedings um, where you basically you haul the person into court in front of the judge. They swear them in. The clerk swears them in. You go out in the hall and have a pre-printed form, front and back, like six pages, and they ask about all their assets under the sun, right? Do you have any jewelry? Do you have any you know, ammunition? Do you have go on a boat, a cart? And you can ask them all these questions. That kind of lays out the groundwork. Okay, what things can we go after? What can we garnish? Do they have bank accounts, checking accounts. Um, but it really becomes kind of a somewhat of a cat and mouse game at that point because you're trying to find assets or accounts to garnish or wages to garnish and um, to collect on the judgment. And you can do it, and I've done it in the past. Garnishment has worked and other things. Um, but that's one thing that everyone needs to keep in mind when you do the judgment route is getting the judgment is sometimes only half the battle. Uh, and you do have to collect on that judgment at that point. So I guess the takeaway, and I'll answer any questions if there are any, and then pass the baton over to Brian, is um, every situation is different. Um, the more a homeowners association or a property management company, um, the better job they do in understanding um, the nuances of the governing documents, the situation within their specific community, and um, the process, they can better have a dialogue with the attorney or others determining which of these two routes to pursue in collecting assessments. Both are effective, both can um, have their certain time and place, um, but at the end of the day, they're both very important tools in making sure that lifeblood of the association, the assessments, keep flowing in on a regular basis. That's it. All right, thanks, James. Does anyone have any questions for James before we turn it over to Brian? All right, I'm not seeing any. If you guys have any, just go ahead and put them in the, the questions and I will get them answered or ask them. All right, take it away, Brian. All right, thank you and thanks, James. Uh, one of the reasons I asked that question to James is um, I, I see different firms have, taking different approaches and ours is a little different. We take the, um, the lawsuit approach first and then move to the foreclosure. So, uh, there are absolutely benefits to both, and, and and I like the effectiveness of what James was talking about. So uh, I would be curious. I wish we could do a take a poll type thing. Um, I'd be curious to see uh, 
what most, uh, in particular the managers, what your communities prefer if they have a preference between uh, going straight to the, the foreclosure versus um, the, the judgment first, the personal judgment. So, um, but we can do that at a different time. So, um, let's see, I don't know if I have control if they pulled up my portion of the slideshow yet, but there we go. Lose the fear. Uh, I, I really appreciated the advertisements that were going out for this seminar. Um, lose the fear for, for a couple of reasons. Um, but before I get into that, I just want to, as Liz was reading um, the or introducing James and myself, I realized that I, I really need to update my, my bio um, that, that I've, I've given to CAI uh, because it seemed to be very Arizona centric. And uh, while I, I do quite a bit of work in Arizona, Arizona is where the or Maxwell Morgan was founded. Uh, I've been licensed in Utah for 20 years now um, and have been actively practicing in Utah for um, I'd say seven years. And, and so I, I really need to update that to reflect the fact that I, I do quite a bit here in Utah. Um, so one of the reasons I love the lose the fear theme, um, I, I grew up loving Halloween. It was one of my favorite holidays. And, um, and in fact, so much so that let me give you kind of an example of what I used to do. I had an older brother that uh, we would go out trick or treating and we would take uh, like pillow sacks and we would rake in the candy. And uh, we, we would a few weeks before Halloween, we would actually um, trace a map of our community and we would map out the route we were going to go to get the most effective way of collecting the most candy we possibly could. And, uh, and so we would try it different ways, different years. You know, we'd go, okay, well, this year we're going to go across the street back and forth. Uh, no, this year we're just going to go straight down one side of the street and then we come straight back the other side of the street. I remember one year, um, we, I grew up right below Wasatch Boulevard. And so we had heard rumors that in the Cove, uh, the Olympus Cove there, that people were handing out full-size candy bars. So we thought, hey, we're going to we're going to take some of our time. And we're going to head up to the cove and we're going to get these ginormous candy bars. And that's going to help, you know, increase our, our payload. Um, so we we went up, we picked a, an area, a neighborhood that we weren't as familiar with. But we we went there and uh, we started knocking some doors. And very quickly, I became very disappointed in the fact that there were not all these full size candy bars like we had been told. Um, and the problem was the houses um, to get to the, the door of these houses was so much more difficult because they were more spread apart. And so we realized very quickly that the effectiveness of that method of collecting candy uh, was not a good one. And we went, went back um, in the future years just to our own neighborhood. So uh, I, I love the lose the fear of non-judicial foreclosures as we're coming into Halloween and, and October and the kickoff of all those, um, those, those fun things to me. Um, and the re one reason I share that story of um, of collecting candy is because it is a lot like collecting money. Um, you have to look at efficiencies. You have to look at um, what what's the best way. And 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 sometimes things are effective. Sometimes they are not. Um, and go, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, I'm not sure if it's working for me. Well, actually, let me see. Okay, let's go back on. Um, I'm, it might be working for me. I'll, I'll try it here for a second. And if it doesn't work, I'll let you know and you can just run with it. So a couple of things that may strike fear into us as, a, as, a, as an industry when we, words that we hear or acronyms that we hear as we're in the collection process. One is the FDCPA. We hear about that. We kind of know, well, yeah, it's something I need to maybe be aware of, and, um, but I kind of get sick of hearing of it. Uh, bankruptcy. Uh, Hey, they filed bankruptcy. Now, what do I do? Uh, the CFPB. This is kind of a newer one, and I want to. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because there's a a big piece of legislation, uh, or not legislation, but a regulatory a rule that is taking effect November 30th that uh, we all need to be aware of because it's it's actually quite significant, and I don't think we've we've heard enough about it as an industry. Um, but so. Those are some of the things, I, as I get into this, I wanna talk a little bit about the way our government works. And it's important because 
um, especially in the context of collections, um, different branches of government have different roles in how we collect. So uh, if you go back to your elementary school days, you've got the legislative branch creates the law, the judicial branch interprets the law, and the executive branch enforces the law. And I'm going to give you examples of each one of these um, these three items here as we we go through um, our the rest of this presentation today. But again, it's important to keep into context who is in control of what's happening um, in in the way that we collect. So first, we're going to talk about FDCPA. So it stands for the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. It's a federal piece of legislation, and it was instituted by our federal government. Attorneys are subject to the act. Uh, that was that was made clear, I think, in the 1980s. The there used to be an exemption for lawyers in regards to the FDCPA, but they took that exemption away. So there's no question that a lawyer who has as a substantial part of his or her practice a collection element to it, that attorney will be subject to the FDCPA. Now the other question that that has been lingering for many, many years is what about management companies? Are management companies subject to the FDCPA? And the question, the response that we have to that as all good attorneys uh, will respond is maybe, right? <laughs> that's, that's the way we love to respond. It depends, or maybe, perhaps. But there is some case law that currently indicates, and it's not in, it's not in the Tenth Circuit, which is what uh, Utah we are governed by, but there is some case law that specifically says management companies are not part of or liable under FDCPA, that it does not govern management companies so long as they are acting solely in their capacity as an agent for the principal. So one of the things we always tell management companies is in all your letters and all the things that go out, uh, put put the name of the association, put it on their letterhead, not management company letterhead put it as signed from the board of directors. Uh, that way you you protect yourself and you don't fall into that potential trap of being subject to the FDCPA. Now, there are a few other ways, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, that in some ways you can kind of get backdoored into being involved in a, an FDCPA lawsuit. And that has more to do with the CFPB and some executive orders that have come out recently um, so, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. So a few things just to be aware of on FDCPA and how to best um, avoid any liability. First off, you need to send an initial notice. The initial notice has five parts that have to be included before you send uh, any further collection activity if you're a third party. So. For lawyers, we have to follow this and we have to follow it to the T, otherwise we are subject to liability under the FDCPA. And this kind of goes in, in line with what James was talking about is how you can begin the collection process. And uh, you always have to add in this 30 to 35 days of, of putting in the FDCPA notice before you take any additional steps. So the initial notice must have the following. Uh, and this is almost verbatim of what it needs to say unless you dispute the validity of the debt or any portion thereof, within 30 days after receipt of this letter, we will assume this debt to be valid. Um, the second piece is if you notify us in writing within the 30 day period of that debt or any portion thereof is disputed, we will obtain verification of the debt or a copy of the judgment against you and mail such a copy to, uh, to you. And then the third one on this, this slide is if requested in writing within the 30 day period, we'll provide you the name of the original creditor. So what, what this, the purpose of this law was in essence to allow, um, allow the, the debtor, the person who owes the money to get information about this debt instead of just heavy handed coming in, somebody who's bought the debt or a debt collector who, um, you know, they're handling hundreds of different types of debt and they don't even know what the type of debt is. They just know there's a dollar amount and they're going after it. And so this gives the, the debtor the ability to know, now wait a minute, what was this bill for that now this debt collector is coming after me for? Oh, it was that medical bill that that I had you know, seven years ago that I totally forgot about and uh, that's what this is. So that's kind of the purpose um, behind this initial notice. 
if, if we go to the next slide, these other two items also need to be included in the, the first notice. Uh, this firm is a debt collector and is attempting to collect a debt or this office or whatever, uh, any information obtained will be used for that purpose. They call this the mini Miranda because not only does this need to be included in the first notice, but it has to be included in every subsequent communication, not just letter, not just email, not just whatever, but on the phone, uh, in person, anytime you are dealing as a, or we as, as third party collectors are dealing with a debtor, we have to use the mini Miranda and let them know, hey, you're talking to me, by the way, I'm a debt collector, any information I obtain from this communication, from this phone call, from this in-person meeting um, will be used for the purpose of collecting the debt that you're owed. And uh, it gets a little awkward, or I remember it used to be a little bit awkward when I felt like I'd answer the phone and the first thing I would have to say is, you know, oh, I'm a debt collector, um, but, you know, it, it's just part of the deal. That's part of what we have to do. So. Uh, as a management company, as managers, or if you want to kind of avoid potential liability, you can always follow these steps, the initial notice and the mini Miranda. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll be considered a debt collector. Um, on the prior slide, um, let's see, it said, well, no, I'm going to go back to the mini Miranda, um, where it says this firm is a debt collector and is attempting to collect debt. You can always put in there, um, this this company may be considered a debt collector and is attempting to collect the debt on behalf of our um, our person we're management for. So there are ways to tweak that a little bit so you're not admitting a fact that you're a debt collector, but you're still protected in the event that something happens down the road. And this may become important as we get more into the uh, CBP that we'll talk about here in a minute. So um, another one that strikes fear quite frequently is bankruptcy. And um, it's one that even attorneys sometimes struggle with, that we don't understand the nuances of bankruptcy and, and what it means. Um, I've, I've, I've been lucky enough to uh, be heavily involved in bankruptcy for at least the first 10 years of my career. I, I did a lot of bankruptcy work with uh, representing homeowner associations in regards to collecting debt. And so I became very well versed in the bankruptcy code as it pertained to HOAs. And um, one little war story that it's kind of fun to share. Um, I remember uh, the bankruptcy bar, what we call like the, the attorneys that solely practice bankruptcy, they're um, very, what? what's a nice way of saying it, Cause conceited, um, more so than normal attorneys, right? Att attorneys in general, I, I, we're, we're all conceited to some degree. Um, that's, that's the stereotypical, oh yeah, it's an attorney, um, the snot nosed whatever attorney. Uh, but bankruptcy, they just, they know their stuff and they go into court, they know all the judges, they know all the trustees. And, and when you go into court, it's a little intimidating because you walk in and they're, it looks like they're all friends and they all know what they're doing. Kind of like us as an HOA industry, we know each other. And when we're in court, when we're in hearings and things like that, um, it, it, it's very easy to, to, to be collegial and nice and, and, and get along. And, and I think that's intimidating to attorneys who don't practice this area of law very regularly because they look at it and say, man, these guys really know what they're doing. Well, it, like I say, it's the same thing in bankruptcy. And I remember before a bankruptcy hearing, visiting with this attorney and just, I knew my part of the law. I knew the part of the bankruptcy code that applied to my client. And, and I kept telling this attorney, hey, you're gonna lose. Uh, why don't we go in, why don't, before we go in, let's just try to settle this, get this resolved so we don't spend a bunch of time and um, and the attorney with his attitude was like, no, not gonna happen. Um, we'll, we'll just have to see what the, the judge says. And I just kind of shook my head and said, okay, let's, let's see what the judge has to say. And sure enough, we walk into the courtroom and there are all these other attorneys in there. They, the way that court calendars work in bankruptcy, they have a list of you know, 40, 50 different cases um, before they call yours. They all say they start at nine o'clock or whatever, but they don't really start until the judge decides that he'll start at number one and go through two, three, four, five. So if you're on number 50 on the list, it may be 10, 10, 30 before you actually get in front of the judge. So sitting here watching the judge and there are a lot of back and forth between both sides and most of the cases that are being called. And finally, he gets to our case. He calls both of us up um, to the, the podiums and, uh, calls the case and then um, looks up 
looks directly at the other attorney and says, what are you thinking? Why are you taking this approach? Um, you, need to, you need to get this resolved, you need to get it resolved now. The HOA is gonna win, so take care of it and make sure that they get paid what they're supposed to get paid, and I don't wanna hear any more about it. And that was it. And so we walked out of the courtroom, uh, his tail absolutely between his legs, and we got outside of the, um, the chamber or out, outside the courtroom, and, and he said, all right, so how are we gonna resolve this? And I said, I already told you how we're gonna resolve it. Pay us what we're owed, and it's done. He said, okay, done, done deal. And the funny thing was, about three weeks later, I got a call from the same attorney. He said, hey, Brian, um, I've got an issue on another HOA case, not one that you're involved with, but I just wanted to pick your brain a little bit and see. Um, and so that to me was, uh, was a very highlight moment where I realized, hey, we got this. Um, as, as HOA attorneys, we can go into bankruptcy court as long as we know our provisions that, that are important to us. Uh, we can we can go in and we can school these other attorneys that that's all they do is practice bankruptcy law, and and so that's um, that's a little kind of war story to, to basically tell you um, here here's kind of your checklist when you're dealing with bankruptcy and I know most of you probably recognize this and understand these principles, but uh, but this is important. Oh, one other item on this: there are basically three types of chapters that we get involved with. Um, for the most part as HOAs, chapter seven, chapter 11, and then chapter 13. And I just wanna give you a very quick um, breakdown of what those chapters are, um, not necessarily to, to uh, really just for education purposes. So if your attorney says, hey, it's a chapter seven, or when you get that notice and you see what it is, then you have a better understanding of what that means. Chapter seven is basically a liquidation case. It means that, that the homeowner is saying, I own so few assets that are unencumbered that it makes no sense to try and restructure my debt. I just want all my debt wiped off, wiped, and, wiped out and forgiven. So that would mean typically that there are very few assets that the bankruptcy court can distribute to the, the creditors who are owed money. The benefit in an HOA is we are what we call a secured creditor. We have a lien on the home, as James talked about uh, substantially, and whether or not we file that notice of lien, the lien exists by statute. Uh, Utah Code specifically says that we have liens against homeowners' properties. And yes, you may need to, you know, in order to foreclose, do certain things, but regardless, you have a lien on the property. So, so what happens in a chapter seven even in a liquidation case, many times the homeowner wants to keep the home. And if they want to keep the home, even though it may be underwater because they have a first and a second and whatever, well, it, the association as a secured creditor also gets a piece of that home. So just because they liquidate and, and they say we're canceling all of our debt, uh, they, you may still be able to collect 100 cents on the dollar. And uh, that's that's a huge advantage to understand and know. Chapter 11 is when a business entity files for reorganization of their debt. So that means they're going to go into the bankruptcy court, they're a business entity, and they want to reorganize the type of debt that they have and say, I wanna pay you know, these types of creditors over a five-year period, this much per month. And uh, then at the end of that five years, the rest of the debt that is owed to some of these individuals is going to be cleared. Uh, it's very similar in some regards to Chapter 13, when it, at least when we see it in the context of HOAs. Usually it's when uh, there's somebody who owns, they've put their, their uh, home into an entity, an LLC, or a company to shield themselves from liability. It's if someone who rents out their properties, you may see that more frequently that's the type of bankruptcy they would file to chapter 11. Still a good thing for an association. If they want to keep the home, then they have to pay the association typically 100 cents on the dollar, including attorney fees and costs. Chapter 13, uh, also similar to chapter 11, it's what we call a reorganization. And that is something where they submit a plan to the bankruptcy court saying, here's how I'm going to pay my debt off. And it, the unsecured creditors typically have to take a big haircut where they, uh, like credit card debt, where they may collect 10, 10 to 15 cents on the dollar. 
But again, as a secured creditor, because we have that lien against the property, usually an association will be able to recover that full amount. But there are a few steps you have to take in order to make sure you collect. First off, you need to cease all collection activity immediately. Um, the bankruptcy code is very clear that when someone files bankruptcy, uh, you cannot take further collection action unless it's going through the proper channels of the bankruptcy court. So stop immediately. Um, I always recommend check with your attorney. There are certain aspects of bankruptcy that are very easy. Filing a proof of claim, not difficult to do. They have forms. You can just kind of fill out the forms. You can submit them. But because you're dealing with a lot of nuances, I never recommend a management company or an association deal with bankruptcy court on your own. Too many tricks that can be played, too many things that can they can kind of set traps for you, the aha traps where if you violate the bankruptcy stay, then it, it's significant and it can you can get penalties imposed and have to pay attorney fees. And so it's it's kind of a tricky way where these people who owe you money, all of a sudden you owe them money. And that's not a fun situation to be in at all. And it I mean, it, it really is, is infuriating. So um, that's that's my recommendation. Check with legal counsel regarding what legal rights you have, depending on what type of bankruptcy, bankruptcy it is. File a proof of claim when appropriate. You have deadlines that have to be met in bankruptcy. If you don't meet those deadlines, the debt is forgiven. And so make sure that this is not one that sits on your desk and you, because, you, because you have that fear, you're not sure what to do. Sometimes I know those are the ones you put to the side and say, I'll get back to that one later. Well, as the piles start stacking up, as the emails start stacking up, it stays in that other pile. And before long, you've missed that deadline. Do not be in that situation because that's not a fun one to have to explain to the client where uh, you go back to the HOA and say, I'm sorry, um, but we, we lost the debt and to try and explain that. Uh, another piece of advice and recommendation is to track independently the pre and post bankruptcy amounts, depending on what type of bankruptcy, but in most bankruptcy situations, you want to do that. What that means is the day they file bankruptcy, uh, we consider anything before the filing date pre-petition amounts. Anything that is filed after the date of the bankruptcy is called a post-petition amount. And they are treated differently uh, under a chapter 13 and a chapter 11. And even under a chapter seven, they're treated differently. So uh, it's nice to be able to track them separately. We do that internally. Uh, as lawyers, we, we will do that. We have that, that cutoff date, but that's a helpful thing for as, as managers, management companies to do as well. And then finally, do not immediately write off the debt. Uh, even if it's a former homeowner, even if it's somebody where you think, oh yeah, bankruptcy, we're done. Uh, if you write it off and ignore the rest of the proceedings, I would say, that they're you know, probably upwards of 30% of the time when homeowners file bankruptcy, within three to six months, they allow that bankruptcy to be dismissed. And sometimes it's intentional, and sometimes it's because they don't know what they're doing. Um, I don't know if any, any of you have ever seen The Office, um, but I love it when Michael Scott comes out of his office and yells out, I declare bankruptcy. Well, <laughs> that doesn't work. You can't just declare bankruptcy and all of a sudden your debt goes away. There's a process you have to go through. And so the exact same thing happens. People think that's all I got to do is declare bankruptcy. And so I'll file the paperwork and I'm done. Well, if you don't, if the homeowner doesn't comply with the bankruptcy code, then the case gets dismissed. And it's as if, it is as if the bankruptcy was never filed to begin with. So you can go after you can collect those amounts. So that's about it on bankruptcy. Um, certainly have to answer any questions on either of those. I do want to spend a few more minutes on the CFPB because this one is not as well known um, because historically it's been kind of in the background, not real active, but more recently it's reared its very ugly head is what I would call it. Um, so it's called, it's the, the CFPB is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It was created by the executive branch to in essence help enforce the law. And what it helps to enforce in this particular case, uh, it helps enforce FDCPA violations. It helps enforce other legislation. So the way the way it works with in our government, legislature passes a law, but it's up to the, gov the, the executive branch of the government to enforce those laws. So if someone violates the law, then they reach out to the DOJ, Department of Justice, and say, hey, this law has been violated. You got to fix it. 
you got to go after them. Well, so what they'll do, the federal branch, uh, the executive branch, they will set up a list of rules and regulations that basically are kind of almost like a quasi-interpretation of the, the legislation that they have been chartered to enforce. So in this particular case, uh, the CFPB, they've come up with what they call uh, Reg F, Regulation F. And um, just to give you a sense of what the CFPB is, this comes from their website. Here are their core functions. Create to provide a single point of accountability for enforcing federal consumer financial laws and protecting consumers in the financial marketplace. Now, read between the lines there. And what that means is we're here to look out for the little guy. We don't care about the person about who is owed money. We are going to protect the, the, the little guy who um, owes the money. And so all of the all of the put things we put into place are here to protect that little guy. So big guy beware. And, and that's that's how we have to take it. That's the approach we have to look at when looking at the regulations that are imposed here. Um, their work includes this rooting out unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices by writing rules, supervising companies, and enforcing the law. So big brother watching, this is big brother watching without any question. What else is their objective? To enforce laws that outlaw discrimination in consumer finance. Now this has been a big one, which discrimination, um, I, I went to a seminar, um, a national seminar about two months ago where they laid out this reg F that's coming out. And one of the things that absolutely shocked me was the claim about discrimination, that the CFPB at this point can come into you as an entity and say, hey, so-and-so is Hispanic. Uh, we believe you were treating that person unfair. You need to prove to us that you were not treating that person unfair. And the burden comes back to you as an entity, whether it's a law firm, management company, and this one, the CFPB can come directly after an association or a management company. It doesn't matter if it's a first, third, second, or third party, um, that the CFPB has authority to go after anybody who they believe has, have, has deceptive or abusive acts. And here's the, the bigger kicker. Um, they can even, let's say that you turn over your collections to a law firm, and that law firm is not following the, the rules set by the CFPB. Well, as a first party, the association and the management company can potentially be brought in claiming that they, in essence, hired somebody who's doing things improperly and they are liable as well. And it's brutal. I mean, it's um, and, and our industry isn't really hit that hard because we're not big enough in the world. Um, they the CFPB currently is going after big, big players that they handle all type, I mean, billions and billions of dollars of debt. But that's not to say that lawyers who, who know our industry and kind of the anti-HOA lawyers that we, we know that they're out there, that they may try to use this as a weapon in the cases against us because they can do that. They can take the rules that have been um, promulgated and they can actually come against an association, the lawyers, the, uh, the management company, and we've, we've had actually a case even before this Reg F was filed where attorneys, they file an FD, FDCPA suit against our firm. They also name the management company and they name the association. And it's just a, a, a shakedown attempt. And that's, that's what it is. But um, the, these, so this is from the C, CFPB website. Um, it's kind of a warning, a heads up that, hey, they are there and they are coming after us. At this national seminar I was at, it was for uh, collections. Um, and what, one of the things that um, they said, they said, you need to recognize that the CFPB relates to the executive branch. So at least for now, and I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter. But for now, the Democrats are the champions of the consumer. They're the champions of the little guy. So we need to, as an industry, recognize the fact that while this administration is in place, or any future Democrat um, who, who holds that the office of the president is in place, this CFPB, they're direction will be to protect the little guy 
and they will be more aggressive. They're one of the, the Biden administration on discrimination. And so even though that really, in many instances, doesn't have a lot to do with collections, uh, I know for most of us, we just, hey, you hit 30 days, 60 days, the notices go out. We don't look at names. We don't even have a database that has race as part of uh, what we look at. But um, nevertheless, that is one of the elements that they actually have specific rules that say you have to be able to prove that you are not uh, discriminating. So here are some of the biggest things that you just kind of need to have on your radar with Reg F. It takes effect November 30th, 2021. It applies primarily to debt collectors, but again, it can also apply to uh, first party debt collectors, including the HOA or the management company. Liability would be based, not up based upon unfair practices in Reg F, not necessarily FDCPA, but they can incorporate FDCPA once they recognize that there are unfair practices um, as des described in Reg F. So the, um, here really are the takeaway. This slide, if you wanna know what do we need to do just to be prepared and to, to kind of protect ourselves, um, there's some rules regarding email and text communications. You must follow strict guidelines for obtaining permission when communicating via email or text. Um, so don't presume that um, that you can just go ahead and because the, e the homeowner has emailed you that you can email back or because the homeowner gave you an email address for parts of, you know, casting votes, or whatever, that you actually can use that for collecting debt. Um, you have to be careful on that. And you have to have easy opt, that's an east, sorry, must have easy opt out options, which means uh, you've probably seen a lot of those on spam email. Um, click here to opt out. Well, now as an industry, a collection industry, if we are sending out a communication via email, we have to have a very easily accessible and re easy remedy for the homeowner to click and say, I want to opt out. I do not want to receive emails or I do not want to receive texts. And you have to track that and trace that. And the bigger companies that do these debt collections, they're built for that, right? But for us little guys that that this is kind of only a piece of what we do, but it's a big piece, but, um, but it's not like all we do, we still have to follow those guidelines. And so you have to have a mechanism of if they have opted out, you cannot communicate with them further via email and you have to track that. And if you violate that, uh, in fact, this, this summer I went to uh, three, four weeks ago, what they were saying is they anticipate attorneys will use this as the bait and switch where they will tell their client a opt out and then send them a new email and see if they respond to that email. And that will be a violation of the of Reg F. So also this will change our initial FDCPA notice. Remember how at the beginning I said, you've got that, um, those five things that have to be put into your letter. Well, now the CFPB has said, you have to use this form letter and it has to have these requirements on there. And if you don't, then again, you're in violation. Here's a little link to that uh, kind of a sample form um, saying, if you use this form, this form letter, then you're in a safe harbor. We will not come after you. Um, but if you modify it, good luck, gloves are off. So um, also credit reporting requirements have changed s somewhat substantially. So if you as a management company or as an HOA are reporting credit issues, uh, I know there are some third party companies out there that will do it for you. And I presumably they're going to be up to speed on this, this reg F, but you want to make sure they are. If you call them up and your rep and say, Hey, so what are you doing to be prepared for reg F? And they say, Oh, what's reg F? Um, then run, don't, don't just, uh, <laughs> run away from that because if they don't know what reg F is at this point in the game, uh, they will absolutely not be compliant with the, the changes made to credit reporting. So not saying that credit reporting is a good or a bad thing, you just need to be prepared for the changes and whoever you use to report that credit on your behalf will, will need to do that as well. Uh, the one other item that historically, there is some FDCPA law that, that kind of pushed us away from this anyway, but statute of limitations. That's what you, we in the, the legal field call an affirmative defense. So in the past, what we've been able to do is list all the debt, all the delinquency, even if it falls outside of a statute of limitation, 
And the homeowner would have to raise the affirmative defense to say, wait a minute, um, you can only go back, whatever, six years, and you're trying to collect debt from 12 years ago. You're not allowed to do that. And that's what they call an affirmative defense. Well, now what the FDCP or what the Reg F says is if you even attempt to collect a debt that is stale, which means it's been, um, that's, there's a statute of limitation that has passed, then you cannot even attempt to collect that. Otherwise, you're in violation. So really that, I believe, is about it. Um, any questions? Now that I've struck the fear into everybody with, with some of these things. Well, that is very easy. Yeah. Um, There's nothing in the chat, so. Oh wait, there, I did get one. What makes a debt stale? So a debt becomes stale if you do not file an action to collect that debt within the times prescribed by statute. So um, it's called, it's basically a statute of limitation. It says you have to start taking action to collect on a debt within a certain number of years. Um, so. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much, James and Brian. That was maybe a little still scary, Brian, um, <laughs> there at the end. <laughs> my no, blood right. pressure uh, rising to bed. I know. Uh, did you, were you aware of some of those things? No. But yeah, to be honest, I, mean, I don't do debt collection. Oh, so. that's true. That's, that's a good point. <laughs> James, I'm still I'm nervous, a, just out of curiosity, James, were you aware of some of those those items? Um, I, I kind of heard about, but not, not the nuances you described. And you said the, um, what's the drop dead date when it becomes applicable, you said? November 30th. Right. So One last good uh, Thanksgiving. Yep. <laughs> That's good Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, James and Brian. We appreciate your time and your knowledge sharing that with us. Um, everybody, please look out for the handouts from our sponsor, our event sponsor, Gore's Construction, and our platinum sponsors for this year, Brewster Insurance and Century West, along with the presentation slides and a link to today's webinar in your email later today. We will be starting our annual meeting here shortly, so you are welcome to stay. In fact, we encourage it. Uh, otherwise, you are free to go. We hope to see you at our Turkey Bowl on November 12th and our next webinar on rental policies on November 19th. Perfect. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a good day. <laughs>